This episode is brought to you by VPP Simplified. Now you can get element by element tracking and guidance for your VPP journey. Every aspect of the VPP requirements in one easy to use interactive spreadsheet. Achieving VPP star status can be tough, but understanding what it takes to get there can be simplified. This VPP gap tool will help you do that. Go to vppsimplified.com for more information. Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own Safety Pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. In this episode, I want to tackle common hazards found in the healthcare industry. So I got a request from a listener Hey, could you talk about some of the hazards that we face in the healthcare industry? And I thought, you know, I got to digging and there are many common similarities in other industries, but you know, what's unique about the healthcare industry, some of the hazards they face, you know, I'm going to highlight some of those so that maybe the rest of us in other industries can learn how those hazards are able to persist in the work environment and some of the things that go into mitigating those hazards, we can learn from, you know, we can use those and apply in other industries. So that's what I want to tackle in this episode. And I want to start with, you know, a study that was done by NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, that cases of work-related asthma and symptoms like wheezing and, and coughing, chest tightness, things like that, shortness of breath, they can occur from exposure to substances used in the workplace. And to better understand chemical exposure in a healthcare setting, uh, NIOSH investigators, they visited uh, several different hospitals, I think maybe like four or so different hospitals, and measured air levels of 14 chemicals that are commonly present in various cleaners and, and disinfectants that are used in hospitals, right? So these are VOCs, right, volatile organic corp compounds, and they measured for those. These compounds, they evaporate at room temperature, getting into the air, and a lot of VOCs could cause or, you know, exasperate existing medical conditions such as asthma. So the investigators took like 143 pairs of different air samples, and each pair included one sample from participants' personal breathing zone and one from just the general area where they performed different cleaning and disinfecting tasks. Now, the results, this was key, right? The results showed that healthcare workers face, you know, exposure to numerous chemicals, um, and they vary by task and by product and even by occupation. For example, nursing assistants clinical laboratory technicians and uh, LPNs, uh, licensed practical nurses, they had higher personal exposures to more than half of the chemicals measured compared to other op occupations, right? So they plan to use this study, right, to link actual symptoms of work-related asthma to specific exposures, tasks, and cleaning and disinfecting products. So they're trying to learn more about the connection between health-related symptoms, even illnesses, and the persistence of, in this case, these VOCs in the workplace. But, you know, this is an example of, you know, all day, every day, healthcare workers are doing these types of tasks. They're, you know, washing hands constantly. They're disinfecting work surfaces and if they're not doing it themselves if environmental uh you know housekeeping environmental services they come in and clean all these you know rooms and and the ERs and these nurses and and practitioners they are coming in and out of these environments all day and they're constantly smelling you know th these cleaners and breathing these VOCs in so it was very important that NIOSH kind of focus on which occupations and which VOCs seem to be persistent. And what we can learn from this is invaluable, you know, in other industries and how we can approach, you know, take a similar approach to monitoring the work environment for commonly used chemicals, known and unknown, right? So that's sort of, 
you know, launched me into the thinking, you know, wow, what if we focus on the healthcare industry and what they're learning about, you know, in this example, chemicals in the workplace and exposure to chemicals in the workplace, let's look at some of the controls they have in place or some of the controls that they're lacking and see what we're doing in under other industries by comparison. What can we learn from that? So let's jump right into that topic after I talk to you about our partners in safety. Who's on location.com? Look, if you're searching for a digital solution for visitor management, contractor management, even employee management at one facility or even remote locations across the globe, tracking their on-site presence when they've arrived or when they've left, and even helping in, a, in an evacuation situation, taking roll call, checking people in, and being able to communicate with them during this uh, emergency evacuation as to whether or not people are safe, then you just need to go to whosonlocation.com. It is a complete people management solution, digital solution. So go to whosonlocation.com, go and download a free trial. It's completely free, no credit card, required, nothing like that. It's absolutely free, no strings attached. See what whosonlocation.com can do for you in managing who's on location. Our next incredible partner in safety is none other than the official floor marking, floor sign company of the Safety Pro podcast, Mighty Line Floor Tape. Look, it wasn't that long ago that OSHA rolled out updates to the walking working surface uh, standard, right? And we need to keep up with managing our workplace from marking aisles, marking where materials go or don't go, pedestrian traffic, things like, you know, things that are critical to environmental health and safety, like eyewash stations, fire extinguishers, exits. You want to mark all these places and organize your workplace, then you need the best product for those floors. That's Mighty Line Floor Tape. They know how important safety is to your organization, and the breadth of the Mighty Line product line covers everything you need to implement a 5S system for the increased productivity of your facility and the safety of your workers. Speaking of 5S, their floor markings are a great way to stay organized. They have angles, dots, arrows. They're just a few of the 5S markings that they offer. And what makes Mighty Line floor tape so mighty? Their patented technology makes it more durable than other floor tapes. It's seven times thicker than the average floor tape. The beveled edge increases durability for forklift traffic, and the peel-and-stick adhesive removes easily. And best of all, it's made right here in the USA. Go to MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast, get a free sample, see for yourself, put a sample of it down in your production area, on your production floor, see how it holds up compared to what you're using now. Again, MightyLineTape.com forward slash podcast. Grab that free sample. Okay, getting back to the healthcare industry in general, I also did some digging. I wanted to see, hey, what are the most frequently cited standards, OSHA standards, for the healthcare industry? Now, for all standards cited for hospitals, I was able to find the number one was, shocking, bloodborne pathogens. Uh, probably things like, uh, reporting and recording, record keeping types of things. Number two was lockout tagout, probably for all the maintenance and repairs and servicing of key equipment, MRI machines, the imaging technology that's used in hospitals. And lockout tagout is probably the reason why that got cited. And the third one has come, number three on the list hazard communication. So, workplace chemicals. Uh, handling workplace chemicals, protection from workplace chemicals, maybe monitoring. You know, it probably runs the gamut from, you know, top to bottom on HAZCOM. And number four was asbestos. And probably from remediation, uh, you have maintenance workers that are doing uh, repairs on pipes that have wraps uh, on these pipes and they're not following proper protocols or contractors coming in doing renovations and expansions, you know, going on all over the country uh, with hospitals. So asbestos is probably, you know, the reason why that's in the top five. But HASCOM, let's focus on HASCOM for this episode and see what we and other industries can take from the lessons learned. Something else I found that was really interesting and I thought, you know, this is going to sort of be the foundation for 
this episode that I wanted to talk about. There was a study, NIOSH did another study, and it showed that precautionary measures to minimize worker exposure to high-level disinfectants, okay, they call them HLDs in the industry. These precautionary measures are not always used. This study can tell us in other industries a lot, okay? We can learn a lot from this. This actually comes from the largest federally sponsored survey of healthcare workers in the U.S. Respondents included anybody who chemically disinfected medical or dental devices in the previous week of answering this survey for a number of of HLDs. I'll list them. I'm not even going to try to pronounce half of them, but I'll list them in the show notes. But the answers to, I wouldn't even focus so much on the chemicals that they were asking about. Listen to these results and you could, you could probably say if these workers in this industry are answering this way about their chemicals and how they use them, imagine what other workers in other industries may answer, right? It might be somewhere, you know, in the ballpark of what these answers were. So, uh, in, and keep in mind, the point was the the information on various exposure controls and even impediments to using PPE was the purpose of the, they, that's what they were assessing, okay, in this survey. So the findings suggest that recommended practices are not always being used by healthcare workers. And I'll give some examples of practices that increased exposure risk for this industry. 17% of respondents never received training on safe handling of these chemicals. 17%, like nothing. They were hired and right to work, okay? Never received training. So what that tells us in not just the healthcare industry, in any industry, hey, how do we onboard our people? We know HASCOM, if you're a safety pro and you're, you're just getting into safety management and you're listening to this podcast for information, you may already know this, you may not. But clearly, the HASCOM standard requires that we inform employees the presence and hazards of the chemicals they may be exposed to during the course of their work. That is, they're going to be working with, around, or handling Okay, this stuff. They have to understand the safety data sheet, precautions to take, the proper use and limitations of PPE, and then we get into PPE. So we've le left HASCOM, and we're going into the personal protective equipment standard, right, and, and all the things we have to train them on that. So start with how do we onboard people? Do we onboard and customize that onboarding orientation? One, we start with what industry are we in in general, what, you know, geography, you know, the layout of the building, how to get in and out of the building, where they're going to be working. And you start to narrow that. So it's like a funnel, right? Your training funnel. You start wide in general. This is what our company is about. And this is what we do. You acclimate them to the organization. And in general, they're going to work in this area, this building, and then in this, this area of the building, and then this department, and then the, the, they're going to be doing these tasks. And you kind of just get narrow and, and more narrow and more narrow as you hone in on exactly what that employee is going to be doing, you need to be looking at that. I mean, 17% never received training on safe handling of chemicals. I mean, that's an easy fix, an easy fix. Okay, 19%, even more, 19% reported that safe handling procedures, they weren't even available. So they may have gotten some training or they may have known but yet the practical means and methods to perform safe handling weren't available. Maybe they didn't have the right containers, the right transfer equipment to move chemicals from one container to another. Maybe they didn't have the right spray bottles or labels or, you know, something like that. They just weren't available. So we have to train people properly in what they're going to be doing, and we have to equip them. We have to provide the means and methods for them to comply. Okay, makes sense? 19%. That's, that's a big number. Listen to this next one. 44% of the respondents did not always wear water resistant, you know, gowns or outer garments. Probably because in this industry, 
and I'm really going to rely on your feedback. I, I have quite a bit of exposure to the healthcare industry. I know uh, plenty of colleagues, close friends that have worked uh, in hospitals. I've done a lot of work in, in these uh, settings as well as a consultant in the past. But I do know that, you know, when we're turning over these rooms, especially in surgical clinics and surgical centers where, you know, doing procedures is the commodity, right? Turning over these rooms is key and you do it quick. And I can see, right, wrong, or indifferent, I can see how cutting corners, not gowning all of the time for certain things, or we get complacent. I, it's only a disinfectant. I use this at home. Uh, you know, I can buy this at Walmart and I'm using it. Yeah, but you don't have your hands in it and breathing these, these vapors 12, 16 hours a day for four or five shifts straight. I mean, that's just not happening at home. So we get this mindset of it's not that bad. It's just disinfectant. It's made to clean things and kill germs. So it's probably helping me or I just don't appreciate the hazard because of lack of training or means and methods. The previous two results I gave you from the survey, but they just don't wear or always wear the proper gowns or outer garments to protect themselves. 44% almost half of these workers. So going along with the, uh, the second one there, I told you to provide them the means and methods. We have to provide the right oversight and we have to provide the right encouragement, the right leadership. And this is getting into this whole sort of holistic culture that we wanna build in any workplace, whether it's healthcare industry, manufacturing, construction, mining, doesn't matter. We need to make sure that each employee understands that Yes, we have a job to do, and yes, it's going to get hectic sometimes, but you know, we, we will never compromise safety and health. If we're willing to compromise the safety and health of each other, how are we able to protect our patients? What does that say about our willingness to protect you know, others? So it's a cultural thing. It kind of gets more high-level strategic thinking, but in a practical sense, bringing it down a level here, we need to be able to, one, set our employees up for success by training them and giving them the knowledge and information they need to work safely. We need to tool them. We need to equip them with the means and methods to comply with that. And we also need to provide the oversight, the encouragement, or even the corrections that are needed from time to time and set the right expectation in the right tone. That's what this tells me. I mean, almost half of the respondents don't always wear, you know, gowning or outer garments, okay? 9% did not always wear protective gloves. I mean, in a, really, in a healthcare industry, I, I shouldn't be shocked. I remember getting years, this was several years back, getting a flu shot, and I had to stop the uh, healthcare worker right, that she was going to administer the shot with a needle, and she didn't even have gloves on. And I thought, hey, I'm, uh, could you put a pair of gloves on? And she's like, oh, I do this, I do this all day, I, I'll be fine. I said, I'm no longer worried about you, ma'am. I'm worried about me. I don't know who you touched before me. If you're willing, you don't know anything about me, and you're willing to put your hands on me, my bare skin with no gloves, and stick me with a needle, which I could bleed, and then you're gonna grab a, a little gauze and stick it on there with your fingers, and you could have a cuticle that's you know cracked cuticle or who knows what, right? And maybe I'm overblowing it. And, you know, people in the healthcare industry kind of roll their eyes. I mean, like, ah, we get needles stuck all the time. That's the problem. That's why, you know, one point whatever million people are running around with, you know, hepatitis B infections. And it's because we, we don't have this sort of discipline of protecting ourselves each and every time. We get complacent. And so I, I told her to stop, put a pair of gloves on. So, um, you know, I wasn't really concerned about her health at that point. I, I, was, I was worried about mine. So, you know, look, not wearing gloves, something as simple as putting a pair of gloves on. Now, gloves all day, we know from, you know, any industry can cause some problems from dermatitis to rashes, skin irritations, things like that. So, you know, we have to be mindful of that, of, uh, you know, having certain breaks between procedures where we're able to take this equipment off, wash and dry, and use some appropriate hand treatment uh, if we have some experience, some of those irritations from wearing gloves all day. But bottom line is, 
if we're handling these chemicals, we have to be wearing the proper equipment. So 9% didn't always wear protective equipment. Some other feedback from this survey was was interesting. Some made the comment, uh, or actually many made the comment, and this is a quote, exposure was minimal. That was the most frequently reported reason for not wearing PPE. This perception of, ah, I was only cleaning up one little table, you know, after a minor procedure and using uh, disinfectant or alcohol or peroxide, right? So that was the most common answer given as to why you don't wear PPE all the time. 12% of respondents to this survey reported skin contact with HLDs during the past seven days, direct skin contact. So if every other day or eat at least once or twice a day, you're getting into contact with these, you know, can you imagine the damage it does over the long term to your skin? We're talking, you know, contact dermatitis, major outbreaks and cracks and dry cracks. And in the healthcare industry, you know, that could actually lead to the increased exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Okay. So 12% reported just in the last week, direct skin contact with these chemicals. Workers uh, that reported skin contact were four times more likely to report not always wearing PPE. So, you know, we've got to parse this a little bit. All right, 12% said they had had direct skin contact with HLDs. Maybe it was on the arm. Maybe it was something unexpected. Um, no. Workers that said I had direct skin contact in the last week were four times more likely to be the ones that reported they don't always wear protective gloves. So we could see a, a huge reduction in those cases by just wearing the gloves more often, right? So look, when precautionary practices aren't followed, workers that handle these chemicals or any chemical in any industry, they're at risk of exposure. So we have to ensure proper precautionary measures are utilized. And that this requires diligence. This requires oversight and leadership, setting the right expectation, developing this culture, both on the employer and the employees in healthcare and in any industry. You know, we're talking about humans here, right? These are still people. doesn't matter how highly educated you are or how blue collar you are. It doesn't matter what job you have. We're humans. We're all people. Okay. And we're all subject to the same rationale of, you know, saying, oh, you know, I'm going to marginalize this because it's just isopropyl alcohol. Uh, you know what that's doing to you, to your skin, it gets into your system. Uh, what about the vapors, what it does? And we have folks developing chronic lung issues like asthma and various forms of this and, and could actually exasperate this in the work environment where we think it's just, you know, non-work related, it's probably coming from work. So we have to look at those things. The bottom line, employers who provide, you know, a safety culture, right, that, that demonstrates a strong commitment to safety and health of the workers, the customers, the patients, whatever as well, okay, they will ensure that adequate resources and safety equipment and training and oversight is available. All right. And the employees, in turn, you know, they're encouraged to seek out training and understand and follow safety procedures. And they feel free to report any safety concerns. You create this sort of two way communication channel where you set the expectations, you drive this culture, they're going to return the favor. Your employees are going to be more likely to stop and say, hey, we need some more gloves in here. Hey, this gown is terrible. I, it's impossible to get on and off. And is there another type we can get? You, you're going to have that kind of a feedback because one, they're going to want to do the job. Two, they're not going to want to tolerate the frustration of dealing with inadequate or poorly designed or ill-fitting equipment. They see the connection, right? I need to do the job. The expectation is that I wear this stuff. This stuff is a pain. Uh, I mean, other than it just generally being an inconvenience to put all this stuff on, but I mean, they're going to look for better ways to improve what they do and still maintain that high level of safety and quality. So you'd start to develop this. That should be our focus. So, hey, look, start with 
you know, how do we onboard people? Do we set the right expectations from minute one when they step foot right into our facility, into our organization? How do we onboard them? Do we go deeper than general orientation, awareness, safety awareness in the orientation? Do we then break people, uh, employees off into groups and subgroups based on where they're going to work and what they're going to be doing and the materials they're going to be handling, okay? And give them sort of this, you know, hands-on, on-the-job training where the work happens uh, with people that are overseeing them. We need a complete onboarding process, not procedure, an entire process that is always evolving and improving. And do, do leaders in the organization, healthcare, manufacturing, construction, mining, aviation, doesn't matter. Do employees understand their role and do supervisors and leaders, especially frontline supervisors, understand their role in encouraging, reinforcing, and intervening when needed? And do we train and equip them as well? You know, in many industries, we promote and, and uh, folks in based on their ability to perform the task that we want them to oversee, not necessarily based on their ability to lead people. So we have, to, we have to invest in those frontline supervisors. They are the linchpin to the organization. They make or break everything. That day-to-day -day contact with that immediate supervisor at any level of the organization, your immediate supervisor makes or breaks your entire experience with that organization. We need to invest in those as well. Hey, look. I wanted to uh, dive into this. It was a, it was a listener request. I'm glad uh, she reached out. Uh, she knows who she is if she's listening. But um, it was great to kind of look into this industry, a very, you know, specialized industry. It's a huge industry in this country. You know, hundreds of thousands or millions of worker, workers in the healthcare industry and, you know, doing great work every day. You know, they face the same hazards, if not more, in some areas, radiation with the chemo drugs, the exposure to all these drugs. And, and it, look at the pharmacy workers. And don't get me going down that path that deal with all of these different pills and powders and, and, and medicines and formularies and are mixing things up. And I mean, it, they're chemists. It's insane. It can, you know, the hazards they face are huge. It's, it's critical that we follow some of these basic protocols. But in general, healthcare workers face a lot of hazards that we sometimes don't really get to look at. So I wanted to highlight some of these so that we could take this information back to our industries and say, what can we learn from how other industries are dealing with things? Some universal truths were apparent. Training, onboarding, leadership, building a strong culture. I mean, all of those things that we talk about. And you know, um, I'm not big on platitudes and guru speak and sage talk and all that, you know, mumbo jumbo. I want to give you real things that you can actually right now hit the pause button go out into your work area, your job sites or, or wherever and say, and go look for this stuff. So that's what I'm going to tell you to do. Go look at your onboarding process. What does your orientation look like? How, when was the last time you sat through the orientation? When was the last time you asked a new hire, hey, what did you think about the orientation? What types of orientation have you had in the past at other companies, good, better or worse or the same? And, and look at that and then go to where folks work with certain chemicals and say, do we have in near proximity where the work happens? Do we have the personal protective equipment you need? Is it assigned to you? Where are you able to keep it? How are you able to replace it? Where do you have to go for that? Have we made that difficult for you to do or easy for you to do, right? Because that, that could be a barrier when somebody's faced with walking, you know, halfway across the plant or two floors down in the hospital setting, for example, and, and to get, you know, replenish something or I have to call for somebody to um, bring something up and it's going to take half a shift, they're going to continue to work and potentially expose themselves. You know, they're going to make that decision. Most humans do. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying if we expect that, then how do we make our processes more resilient to that? How do we make it easier for them to make that right decision? No, other than saying, you know, it's the right thing to do, even though it's a pain in the butt and we're going to keep this stuff in a warehouse four miles away, we're going to make you go get it anyway to do this 30 second job. That, that's not enough. We have to support 
and, and equip these workers to make it easy for them. We need to build our processes resilient to the failures we know most humans are, are going to make given these sets of circumstances, okay? So that's what I wanted to leave you with in this episode. A great suggestion from one of our awesome listeners uh, in the healthcare industry. We can learn a lot from them. So and a, and a bigger picture here, you know, when you're done listening to this, go think about people you know in other industries, you know, network with them, reach out to them, shoot them an email. I want you to do this right away. Shoot me an email and say, hey, I know you deal with chemicals in your industry. It's a completely different industry, but how do you manage those in the workplace? And then, you know, maybe you can get some good ideas. How do you manage training, onboarding, things like that? So network, learn from uh, the mistakes of others. I, I did an, uh, an episode on that, actually. Uh, you want to go back and look at that one. Uh, learn from the mistakes of others, not just in your organization, but outside your organization, in the business community. You know, trust me, you're not going to live long enough to make them all yourself. Take that for what it's worth. Keep the emails coming. I love hearing these suggestions and uh, forces me to explore new areas of occupational safety and health management. And uh, leave me a note. Tell me what you think. And until the next Safety Pro podcast episode, as always, be safe. Be safe.